नमस्ते वेलकम बैक टू स्थित प्रज्ञा चैनल यू आर वाचिंग एडब्ल्यू सर्टिफाइड डेटा इंजीनियर एसोसिएट एग्जाम क्वेश्चन एनालिसिस सीरीज आई नो इट्स बीन अ वाइल आई थिंक द फर्स्ट टाइम वी अपलोडेड और एट लीस्ट द फर्स्ट टाइम द डेटा इंजीनियर स्टार्टेड व्हेन वाज इट अप्रैल एंड आफ्टर दैट आई डिडंट सी एनी क्वेश्चंस बट मेनी ऑफ यू हु टुक द एग्जाम कंफर्म दैट द 80 क्वेश्चंस दैट वी अपलोडेड you got all your questions from those 80 questions so <laughs> isn't that wonderful i hope you know you and i mean obviously whoever passed won't be here but whoever is going to attempt this exam you can go check the comments i'm not making it up uh, and uh, more questions started flowing um i think i hope we will get more questions as we go that makes the exam competitive right if we are going to have same 80 questions forever what's the fun in it we won't learn that much that being said this is aws you already know they are going to add questions as the exam progresses it's not like data bricks it's not like python it's not like other exams where the questions remain static they don't change much at all that being said let's not waste any time and uh, let's get started and another thing if you are new here this is how i want you to watch these videos or watch these questions first i want you to read the question and i want you to read the options then pick which option you think is the right one based on whatever deductions you make or whatever knowledge you have then resume the video and watch what i am going to explain or listen to my explanations why an option is right why an option is wrong then you will know what mistake you made why i'm asking you to do this because if you just sit there lay down and just listen to my analysis then you won't remember it it will be like you know you listening to your professor in the school or college of course we are not going to remember unless we go home and read it back again so same thing here so i would prefer you to read the question answer the options then listen to my uh, analysis that way trust me you are going to remember the analysis or the reason that why one answer is right one answer is wrong for a time so i want you to spend that time i am seeing so many people asking me which video i should if there are like 10 videos which video i should watch to pass i mean come on I, these are all exam questions i am putting it in front of you and still you want to pick one video two video i don't know what you all are doing these days all the questions are here even then people are like i don't want to watch that many questions give me like what i should watch that will be asked in exam this is aws not data bricks data bricks hardly has 100 questions in each of the exam so you can prepare those 100 and you can pass but this is data bricks i am talking about this is a new exam so you only have 100 but if you go see other exams you have 500 questions 700 questions yes it's aws it's tough but all the questions are out there and i mentioned several times even though an exam has 500 questions all you have to do is watch 200 then you learn the topics and those topics will be repeated again and again in whether it is 500 or 700 or 1000 questions that's what aws does they reframe the question but the concept is the same so i again tell you watch them don't ask which one video which you know i cannot watch all this if you cannot then i don't know the guarantee i give you that you will pass is when you follow what i tell you to i know that i am lecturing you guys but seriously if you are just passing the exam then what is the point of it of course you are going to work on if it if it is as work or of course you are looking for a job you should know the concepts and i am not presenting the theory here i am going through the questions and explaining you the concepts the be better you know the only thing you can do is you know watch these videos as i suggest you to do and then do the quiz sets anyways again it's up to you okay so this question it's very simple um they are crawling through let's assume some file to um, have this table called orders and uh, the table is already there now they want to add new partitions and they already listed those two partitions here but there is a requirement to it as soon as you see adding new partitions you will be like oh it's very easy use msck repair sure 
you can use that but msck repair what does it do it goes through all the files in that path which means it scans all the folders all the files in this location and then it figures out the partitions and whichever partitions are not on the table then it will add them but the requirement clearly said do not scan the folders and files so that immediately tells us msck repair is gone and there is no such thing as repair table so that is gone now we are left with two options one is alter table add partition another one is alter table modify partition first of all you can add modify and another thing is these are new partitions right see this how can you modify new partitions this has to be already there um, i never modified partitions maybe this is there but this option might be there i might be wrong but these are new partitions so if they are not there how can you modify so what do you do it's simple you just add the partitions manually you only have these two so why are you doing these two because we don't want to scan all the files and folders yeah you can do that by using msck repair but just remember if there are thousands of files this will take forever to add these two partitions so instead of that if you don't want to scan them just add them manually simple okay another question so there are uh, this much data of uncompressed csv files in s3 and they want to evaluate athena as a one time query engine now they want to transform the data to optimize query runtime and storage costs whenever you see this particular option like optimize the query runtime and storage definitely csv files are not optimized you know they take some time uh, if you are reading csv files they are not optimized and storage costs whenever you see storage costs they are talking about compressions right if you have a 15 t 15 tb file as csv storing on csv that will cost more when you compress this depending on the data it might go back to 5 tb we never know right so the lower the size the lower the cost so whenever they ask about storage cost it's about compression and here they are talking about optimized query runtime and there are a couple of formats that you can use on athena or you know even if you are querying from something else um, you need to have the you cannot have the files in csv or json xml they are not uh, optimized uh, formats if you want to sorry if you want to optimize your queries they are not the format you should have instead you should have parquet or arc etc so in this case i think if they even mentioned avro uh, json csv csv it's already there with zip zip is fine for a bit it's okay but if you are comparing compressions uh, zip is not that uh, great compressor compared with others and you know, we all learn, you know this is kind of free but anyways csv optimizing query big no no uh, because csv is a row based format it stores row by row right which is inefficient for analytical queries and while zipping can reduce storage costs it doesn't address the core performance issues of row based format so eliminate it and then we have json format compressed with bzip2 similar to csv json is also a row based and not ideal for analytical queries bzip2 is a slower compression codec compared to snappy which could impact query performance so with that for that reason this is a no as well as json is a no and apache avro and lgo avro is again a row based format although it has some advantages over csv and json still we don't pick it if the question asks we need row based format then compared with csv json we will go with avro but if you compare it with parquet to or if you want to optimize query never go with row based and lgo yes this is a faster compression codec but the row based nature of avro still makes it less efficient than parquet for analytical queries so optimize queries go always with parquet why because parquet is a columnar storage format meaning it stores data by column instead of by row this is highly efficient for analytical queries in athena as it allows for selective reading of only necessary columns 
significantly reducing the amount of data scanned. Parquet supports predicate push talk, which allows Athena to filter data at the storage layer before retrieving it, further improving query performance. And then we are using Snappy. Snappy is a fast compression codec designed for higher speed and reasonable compression. It strikes a good balance between compression ratio and decompression speed, making it well suited for analytical workloads. All right, here it's about a migration question. Uh, basically, they have Apache Airflow to orchestrate their on-premise data pipelines, and they run SQL data quality check tasks as part of those pipelines. Now the company want to migrate this to AWS managed services, and they wanted this to be done with least amount of refactoring. Least amount of refactoring means you have to use the same uh, service, which is Airflow on AWS. And if you know, uh, AWS services, then we have a managed Apache uh, Airflow, which is MWAA. Um, so that's what we are looking for. <clears throat> so you can go ahead and pick option C, not anything else. So let's go through different options. Let's see why they are wrong. And option A is talking about using AWS outposts. You know, what do outposts do? They can bring AWS services on premises, but it's a more complex solution than necessary for this migration. It involves setting up and managing outposts infrastructure. And nowhere in the question it said that the infrastructure has to reside in the on-premise service center, so forget about outposts. And option B is talking about custom Amazon machine image which involves building and maintaining a specific server image for Airflow. This adds operational overhead and doesn't leverage AWS managed services, right? You are using EC2 and they asked us to use managed services. So forget about it. And option D is talking about complete refactoring. Again, we said least amount of refactoring, but here it will be a huge amount because you are completely rewriting uh, your Airflow pipelines to step function workflows and you are converting SQL uh, quality checks into Python Lambda functions. This involves significant refactoring efforts, so forget about it. We are going to go with option C. Why? Because they asked us managed services. We have a managed services, which is MWAA. And uh, this means your existing Airflow DAGs are directed as a click graphs and configurations should be largely compatible requiring minimal changes minimal to no sometimes minimal i would say not no uh, and mwaa which is managed workflow for apache airflow supports the execution of sql tasks within airflow workflows you can likely keep your existing sql data quality check tasks with little to no modification i don't know i mean they already asked us everything and this is the only option that satisfies that. Some people are, are, are going to argue about this answer. We are going to have fights in the comments. Uh, let me know what you think is the answer for this one. So basically, um, company uses an AMR as an ETL pipeline to transform data that comes from multiple sources. Now the data engineer must orchestrate the pipeline to maximize the performance. And you need to do this at a most cost effective way. So some people will think it's glue workflows because glue is ETL, etc. And uh, <clears throat> we just spoke about this one, MWA Airflow. Um, but this is a third party managed service. Obviously, you are going to have some costs involved in there, but we'll look at these solutions. First of all, event bridge. Um, people might think even some people might think event bridge is the right answer because this is excellent for event driven architecture. But this lacks the built-in capabilities for complex workflow orchestration that some other service offers this is not a workflow or orchestration service first of all remember that using event bridge would likely require additional services like lambda and actually event bridge uses service step function for orchestration this triggers step function for orchestration so eliminate that one then we have the mwaa it's very powerful, right? MWA, what is it? It's a managed service with associated infrastructure costs because this is a managed service. This is not a serverless service. And when you are deploying or provisioning a managed service, and even when you are not using it, what will happen? Even when this is idle, 
there will be costs involved with it and we want to it to be most cost effective which means we are looking for a serverless solution because whenever you are not running this your serverless solution won't cost you anything but this will managed services will so this could be less cost effective compared with other serverless for simple etl pipelines and then we have glue workflows this is the fight that will happen between these two one thing is both kind of orchestrate and another some comments will say glue is an etl so if you want to orchestrate etl well, glue but glue workflows are tailored for yes glue workflows are tailored for etl but might not offer same level of flexibility and control as step functions and glue is specifically or you know it's better to use glue workflows is better to use if you have glue jobs if you want to orchestrate glue jobs and in between if you have something else use it but not for completely something different that doesn't even have glue so you use this because step functions is a serverless service meaning you only pay for actual transition transitions and executions within your workflow and this is highly cost effective compared to maintaining always on resources like mwa step functions is specifically designed for building and managing complex workflows it excels at coordinating multiple steps handling errors retries and ensuring reliable execution of your etl pipeline step functions seamlessly integrates with emr allowing you to trigger clusters submit jobs and manage steps it also integrates with other services like lambda for custom logic glue for data cataloging and more this tight integration ensures a smooth and efficient orchestration process and finally step functions is built for high performance and can handle large scale distributed workflows aligning with the performance requirements of the etl pipeline another question about querying using athena now what is happening is they are storing you know alb access logs in s3 and they are using athena to query these logs to analyze the traffic patterns and the data engineer created an unpartitioned table in athena and as the amount of data increased the response time for queries also increased of course it is going to because the number of files are going to increase now he wants to improve the query performance in athena and you need to do it with least operational overhead okay first of all whenever you have log files or anything like that you don't create tables manually instead you will use aws glue crawler so that it can crawl the files and then it can create the respective tables that's one thing remember it and when you have log files or most uh, most of the scenarios you might be you know getting data daily or hourly it's better to partition it why because you might not be doing analysis on entire all the logs every day you will be only doing with maybe if you today whatever logs that are added today for that you don't want to go through the entire table right it doesn't make any sense so when you create partitions and if you query using that partition date it will only go to that folder it won't go to all the files in the folder anyways that being said let's look at the option option a is trying to use aws glue job while glue jobs are powerful they require you to write custom code to define the schema and partition logic which is more complex than using what did i say a crawler which will come to that in a minute and option c is do use is doing something trying to do the same using aws lambda functions which these are a good option for data transformation but they would require additional code to handle partitioning and writing metadata to the glue data catalog and then we have option d which are using apache hive and lambda functions this option is even more complex involving combination of hive for table creation and lambda for data transformation it's unnecessary for this use case as glue can handle both schema discovery and partitioning it can also handle the partitioning glue crawlers are designed for this exact purpose automatically discovering and cataloging data in s3 they are easy to set up and require minimal ongoing maintenance glue crawlers can automatically determine the schema of your alb access logs and infer suitable partitions 
Glue data catalog is natively integrated with Athena. So once the crawler has cataloged your data, it's immediately available for querying in Athena. Glue crawlers can handle large amounts of data and scale as your log volume increases. And if you are interested in seeing real-time projects designed by AWS, where we have implemented this exact scenario, go check out our two playlists. We have two playlists on our channel, which are called AWS Cloud Quest. Okay, so overall on this channel, we have 98 AWS real-time projects. Okay, who created, who designed these projects? Well, AWS designed them. How did they design it? Based on the real projects that they did for different customers they created this project so aws designed these projects and we implemented it on this playlist and the first playlist which is aws cloud quest it has 1 to 25 projects and then we have another playlist called aws projects for beginner to expert this has 26 to 98 projects uh, so the project that i'm talking about glue uh, it would most probably be in the second playlist go check it out and trust me, once I can guarantee you one thing. Yes, when I guarantee something, if you follow it, you will get 100% success. I can guarantee you by after watching all these 98 projects, you will have at least two to three. You will get at least two to three AWS real time experience. Real time experience. How much? Two to three. You never. If you never worked on AWS, then this is this is the right playlist for you. Go check it out. And if you don't believe me, watch those videos and come in the comments and let me know that I lied. If you think I lied. Okay, if not, then you need to subscribe and you need to bring 10 more subscriptions. All right. So let's go to the next question. All right. So here we have a company that uses storage gateway to transfer files from on-premise to S3. Now we need to set up a process that will automatically launch a glue workflow to run a series of glue jobs when each file transfer finishes successfully and we need to do this with least operational overhead. Least operational overhead means don't try to use some services to uh, create your solution and for all the AWS exams I, I actually recommend two steps. Step one, try to see in the options is there any a feature of the service that is mentioned in the question okay first of all they are asking for this one and their service they mentioned are these two and you cannot so usually they will mention a service and see if there is a feature in the option for that service that can solve this problem okay step one is look for the features of the services and step two if you cannot find a feature step two is look for aws native service AWS native service that can handle this. Basically, all exams in AWS will follow these two steps. They won't go beyond these two steps. Okay, now that being said, since there is no um, feature that is mentioned for file gateway or S3 that can trigger glue workflow, the next thing is native services. Look for an AWS native service that can actually do this. And we are talking about triggering something which is based on file transfer finishing which is an event so event based triggering so when that comes into mind what should come to your mind event bridge should come to your mind okay let's look at other options option a is talking about a scheduled event right at the time of day set up scheduled event but we are not looking for schedule we are looking as soon as the file transfer do we know when the file comes we don't know but we want to trigger this when the file comes. So if you are going to schedule, how is that going to work? Right? It's go not going to work. This relies on a predetermined schedule, which might not align with the actual file transfer completion times. And it could lead to delays in processing or unnecessary workflow executions. And then we have option C. This requires manual intervention for each file transfer, increasing the risk of uh, errors and delays. And option four or D, while this option is also event driven, it introduces an additional component, which is the Lambda function that needs to be managed and maintained. It's a viable solution, but requires more operational overhead than directly using event bridge. 
This option directly connects the completion of a file transfer to the initiation of glue workflow, ensuring immediate action without manual intervention. And Event Bridge is designed to handle event driven workflows, making it a natural fit for triggering actions based on specific events like successful file transfers. This solution requires minimal ongoing maintenance because we are not writing any Lambda function. And once the event bridge rule is set up, it automatically handles triggering the workflow for every successful file transfer. There is a lot going on this one. So basically, they have Postgre to process and store live transactional data. Now they also use Redshift to store data warehouse as a data warehouse. They have ETL jobs running every morning to update this data warehouse with new data from Postgre. The company is rapidly growing and it needs to opt cost optimize the redshift cluster they want us to create a solution to archive historical data and uh, you know it, the engineer must be able to run analytical queries that combine data from postgresql redshift and wherever we archive it to so from these three places we should be able to effectively query and the solutions must keep only the recent 15 months of data in redshift to reduce costs okay now first of all how do you combine data from these three solutions we don't know where we are archiving so how do where do you archive so let's look at uh, the options and decide these two and uh, if you look at option b they are talking about they are use redshift spectrum to query live transactional data that is in postgresql which you cannot do Redshift spectrum you can use to query only data that is on S3, nowhere else. So that's a goner. And then they are talking about create a materialized view in Redshift that combines live current historical data from different sources. First of all, well, Red views you can, if you're talking about creating materialized views on Redshift, you can only create views on Redshift tables. Live data is in PostgreSQL, historical data will be mostly in S3. So how are you going to create a materialized view on top of S3 and this, it's not possible. So that leaves us with first option. So whenever you see combining queries from multiple places, not just on Redshift, but on other databases, there is a feature called Federated Query feature. Technically, what this does is it can query from other databases as well. So that's what we are going to configure to query this live transactional data in PostgreSQL database. So that is gone. Next thing is our archive. How do we archive? So these two options are talking about that. Schedule a monthly job to copy data that is older than 15 months to S3 by using unload command delete the old data from the cluster then configure the spectrum to access okay this looks uh, doable to me let's look at this one as well so the 15 months to glacier flexible retrieval by using unload command that is something that i don't want to do right you might be thinking like okay you are using glacier which will reduce costs maybe i would want to use this but for long term storage, yes, sure, but it is not ideal for frequent querying. We, it's already mentioned, right? They want to query it frequently uh, to retrieve the, uh, sorry, frequently query due to its retrieval model, right? S3 standard or intelligence steering are better suited for Redshift spectrum access instead of Glacier. So we'll go ahead, cancel that and we'll pick this one option, right? So here we are picking S3, even though it didn't mention, but we don't go with this. If you're combining the live data with that data, obviously you don't want to use uh, Glacier Flexible. This is for just archiving and uh, if you want to just query maybe multiple times a year, not combine with uh, live transactional data and query it because this is going to be like typically every day or multiple times a day. All right, this is an interesting question. So a company has many IoT devices, facilities in the world, and they use Kinesis data streams to collect the data from these devices. And the data includes device ID, capture date, measurement type, measurement value, and facility ID. And they are using facility ID as a partition key. Now the operations team recently observed many write throughput exceeded exceptions. And they found that some shards are heavily used, but other shards were generally idle. 
in order to answer this question obviously you need to know how the uh, dynamo db works so that you can answer this more appropriately first of all what is the partition key it's on the facility id whenever you have a key that has partition remember it has to be evenly distributed you should pick a key that is evenly distributed not a uh, skewed clearly facility id i don't think would be a good fit for partition key why because if one facility has many devices and if the other facility doesn't have any devices then as you know the data skew happens and as they mentioned some shards heavily used but others are idle it can be because of this so then let's learn about this more and look at option uh, b increase the number of shards well what happens if you increase the number of shards you know you can provide more capacity but it doesn't address the root cause of the uneven data distribution right because the data is distributed unevenly you will likely end up with same issue of same shot some shots being overloaded while others remain idle so increasing number of shots won't solve this problem at all it will just add more capacity and archive the data on producer side this might reduce the overall data volume sent to kinesis but it doesn't solve the uneven distribution problem and then we have uh, change the partition key from facility id to capture date again this will be the same as facility id why because capture date will be the date of if there is a particular day where you have more of this happening for whatever reasons then for that particular day you will have more uh, there will be more again it will be uneven right using capture date as partition key might create more event distribution than facility id yes i will agree with that but it could still lead to unevenness if data generation patterns vary significantly over time so that leaves us with option option sorry option a why because remember the current partition key facility id is causing data to be uneven likely i mean since they don't have but most likely based on the that's why they explained it unevenly distribute across shards whenever you have a partition it distributes on different partitions according to the partition right so since one facility with more data will go to one shard that's why this is happening some facilities might generate significantly more data than others leading to hot spots where certain shards are overwhelmed while others remain underutilized using a random generated key will ensure that data is more evenly spread across all shards this will distribute the right throughput and prevent individual shards from exceeding their limits so always remember to use a unique key. okay randomly generated key is obviously going to be a unique key so it will distribute data evenly between all shards because since it's unique you won't have a, a same going to the same shard A data engineer wants to improve the performance of SQL queries in Athena that run against sales data table. Data engineer wants to understand the execution plan. Okay, we want the execution plan. And the data engineer also wants to see the computational cost of each operation. So we want these two things. Okay. In a SQL query, what statement does the data engineer need to run? Okay, that's cool and in most of the sql variants like sql server mysql etc if you want to see the execution plan you use the explain command that we are aligned with but does the execution explain give computational cost what do you think does it give it this will only explain will only show the query plan it doesn't show the runtime statistics of each operation or it doesn't show the computational cost and the syntax should be explain select star from and this one just does the same explain and it does from sales and so the syntax is wrong so in order to get the computational cost you need to use analyze as well both are using that but the syntax for this is wrong it is it should be explain uh, analyze select star from sales for that reason our answer is C explain gives you the execution plan analyze gives you those computational cost details all right let's look at 
all the options if you look at all the options two are using data streams two are using firehose you can cancel a and d immediately because first of all this one is directly sending to splunk as the destination which you cannot so eliminate it yes you can you have to use some other uh, intermediary which they are using lambda function even though you can do this we won't recommend to do this because this is more operational overhead and we need to do it with least operational overhead similarly b and c one is doing directly splunk as the destination another is using lambda and lambda we will eliminate because more operational overhead and yes data firehose you can use splunk as the destination so that's what it's easy actually, but you should know whether what supports as a destination and what not. <laughs> okay, so option B is your answer. You can configure direct delivery to Splunk's HTTP event collector, eliminating the need for an intermediate Lambda function. And by using a CloudWatch log subscription filters, you can directly route VPC flow logs to the Firehose delivery stream without additional components or custom code. A data lake they have the company has a data lake and it is a source of data from business units and they are using Athena for querying and storage layer is S3 with glue data catalog as metadata repository. Now the company wants to make this data available to these two people, but they first need to manage fine grained column level access for Athena based on user roles and responsibilities. Whenever you see the word fine grained column level data access either for S3 or Athena, even Athena is kind of querying data on top of uh, S3. You see these words, just go for lake formation because lake formation kind of gives you that much control over this. But let's go through other options. Option B is uh, trying to do it with a resource based policy for glue tables. While you can use IAM policies to control access to glue tables, it doesn't provide that granular column level data permissions needed in this scenario and um, kind of same applies to option c this option only provides access control at table level not at column level and option d is using ram resource access manager typically used for sharing resources across accounts not for managing fine grained access within accounts so that leaves us with lake formation which is designed specifically for managing fine grained access to data lakes it allows you to define granular permissions at the table column and even row levels lake formation uses policies to grant or deny permissions based on iam roles this makes it easy to manage access for different groups of users based on their roles and responsibilities. Lake formation integrates seamlessly with Athena, enforcing the defined policies when users query data through Athena. Lake formation provides a centralized location to manage all data access permissions in your data lake, simplifying governance and security. A company has developed several glue etl jobs to validate you know and transform data in s3 and the etl jobs load data into rds my for mysql in batches once every day and the etl jobs use dynamic frame to read the s3 data and currently all the data in s3 bucket is being processed every day now the company wants the pro job to process only incremental data so how do you do it with least coding effort Let's look at option A, which is trying to use DynamoDB logging. While you could log processed file status in DynamoDB, it would require custom code to implement the logic for tracking processed data and filtering out already processed files in subsequent runs. And option C is trying to use CloudWatch metrics, which can provide insights into job performance, but they don't inherently track processed data for incremental processing. You would need to build a custom logic to utilize these metrics for filtering. And option D, deleting processed objects is not a recommended approach as it permanently removes data from S3. It's better to preserve the original data and use job bookmarks to manage incremental processing which is a feature of glue remember our steps step one and step two this is step one job bookmarks are a built-in feature of aws glue jobs 
they automatically keep track of the last processed data location ensuring that subsequent runs only process new or updated data enabling job bookmarks requires minimal code changes you simply need to enable the feature in your glue job configuration this approach ensures that your etl jobs only process the necessary data reducing processing time and cost i would call this an easy one so basically there is an application that runs on ec2 instances within a vpc and they want to collect flow logs for the vpc and analyze network traffic how do you do it now let's go to different options okay so option a and b are trying to use cloudwatch logs and option a with athena cloudwatch logs storage can be expensive especially for large volumes of large data querying logs directly from cloudwatch logs using athena can also be less efficient than querying optimized files and then we have option b same thing cloudwatch logs and open search service open search service is a powerful analytics engine but it can be costly for storing and analyzing large volumes of log data it's better suited for real-time log analysis and alerting and then we have option c which is using s3 in text format and then athena while storing flow logs in s3 in text format is cheaper than cloudwatch logs querying text files in athena is less efficient than querying parquet files this can lead to higher cost due to increased data scanning so we'll go with s3 but apache parquet format s3 we already know it's a highly available sorry scalable and durable object storage service with a tiered pricing model it offers a very cost effective way to store large volumes of data like vpc flow logs and parquet we already learned it is a columnar storage format that is highly efficient for analytical queries it allows athena to scan only the necessary columns significantly reducing the amount of data processed and therefore the cost of your queries and athena which is a serverless query service that charges based on the amount of data scanned by using parquet you minimize the data scan resulting in lower cost compared to querying raw text files this question is about uh, testing your knowledge on key distribution on redshift so basically there are four tables transaction storage locations customer information oh, sorry three tables and they use four reserved amazon redshift cluster nodes and all three tables are even table distribution right there are different distribution types which is auto even and all and there is a key distribution as well the company updates the storage location table only once or twice every year or every few years not even a year so they recently noticed that redshift queues are slowing down because the entire storage location table is constantly being broadcast to all four compute nodes for most queries the data engineer wants to speed up the query performance by minimizing the broadcasting of the storage location table and we need to do this at most cost effective way how do we do that so let's look at different options so first thing if you don't want to broadcast it to all four which means first first of all it is broadcasting means data is not available in all four nodes so if you want to avoid this happening all you have to do is put data on all four nodes how can how can you do that which event is table distribution won't do that because it's evenly distributes between these four nodes if there is 100 records then it puts 25 in each of the four nodes right so obviously then you need to bring in uh, data together and broadcast it to all four like this doesn't have 75 so bring 75 put it there this 75 75 75 but you don't want to avoid that right so what do you do you put all 100 records on all of them it's a small table this is only um, updated couple of years once right so obviously which means it's a small table and smaller tables it's better to broadcast them that is what is happening but by putting them in uh, all nodes it will really help with this so that's what we need to pick here if you look at option b this is using key distribution key distribution can improve joint performance for tables with a clear distribution key 
it might not be the most efficient for a small infrequent update table like storage location it could also lead to data skew if the chosen key doesn't distribute data evenly right if these 100 records let's say if 80 of those records have the you know same kind of key then they will go to one or skew thing skew will happen so forget about that and then we have option c talking about adding a joint column to sort key this might help with joint performance in some cases, but it doesn't directly address the broadcasting issue caused by the event distribution. It could also increase the storage footprint of the tables. So forget about it. And finally, we have option D. They are talking about upgrading the Redshift node itself. Upgrading the node size will increase cost and might not solve the broadcast issue entirely. It's a more expensive solution compared to simply changing the distribution style and we need to be cost effective so forget about that so what is the answer answer is changing it to all distribution when a table is set to all distribution a full copy of the table is stored on each compute node this eliminates the need for broadcasting the small infrequently updated storage table as it's already present on every node this directly addresses the cause of slowdown Changing the distribution style doesn't incur any additional costs. It's simply a configuration change within Redshift. And all distribution is ideal for smaller dimension tables that are frequently joined with larger fact tables, like the storage location table in this scenario. Okay, this is the easiest question I have seen so far. You have a table with a column city name and you need to query all rows that have the city name that starts with SAN or EI. So they are trying to sell check your querying knowledge sql knowledge so you better be prepared for this one if you're not familiar with sql then i guess you need to learn okay let's look at this i and in order to understand this you need to understand this symbol which is called tilde or tilde whatever you want to call it and then you have the carrot symbol and then you have the pipe symbol which is you can see this one and then you have the asterisk or a star of oh, my asterisk really sucked. okay first one let's see tilde or if you are not yeah this symbol i'm talking about this operator in redshift is used for regular expression matching it filters rows based on the pattern specified in the regular expression so when you use this it tells that whatever i'm going to write is going to be a regular expression and the caret symbol denotes the start of a string if you know about regular expression then you will know whenever you put this it is start of an expression whenever you put dollar it's end of an expression this uh, start of a string sorry not expression it ensures that the matching pattern starts at the beginning of the city name value okay and then you have the pipe symbol this acts as an r like whenever you put this this is r like this is and right that is the you know ampersand you are seeing here so allowing you to match in this case either san or ei san or ei here san and ei so you can immediately go ahead and eliminate these two based on what our knowledge we have because we want san or ei ampersand is and san and ei we don't want that okay and then we have asterisk this indicates or the star indicates zero or more occurrences of the preceding character or group in this case it allows for any characters to follow san or ei like san diego el dorado etc we don't care about what follows we are telling the starting is this now this three, two we already eliminated it right and as in again the dollar sign is incorrect here and uh, we already eliminated so between a and b which one both are r but which one will you pick so one has dollar another one has carrot as i mentioned dollar sign you don't use it eliminate it we will use the ampersand so not ampersand carrot symbol right so that's it that's about this answer right so san if there is san francisco this will meet because star first it will san followed by anything don't care right l el paso l we don't care about what follows so if you want to do any kind of select on something like this you can use something like this or you can use other functions and query as well but 
it's up to you how you want to write a query okay whenever i see a big question i i, I refer them to as questions with full of drama so basically you know a company needs to send customer call data from its on premises postgre to aws to generate real time insights now they must capture load a uh, capture and load updates from operational data store which is their postgresql and the data continuously changes and they are con using dms ongoing replication task to have to achieve this one okay the task this particular task it reads changes in real time from postgresql database transaction logs for each table and then they are sending the data to redshift cluster for processing now the data engineer discovered latency issues during the cdc and he immediately pointed his finger hey, hey it's not redshift it's postgresql <laughs> that the source database is causing the high latency now how do you confirm whatever the data engineer is saying how how do you do that right it's full of drama let's go through option a it's trying to use cdc incoming changes metric this tracks the rate of incoming changes from the source database while it can indicate a high volume of changes it doesn't directly pinpoint the source database as the cause of the latency now option b logical replication configuration well verifying logical replication is important for setting up cdc but it doesn't help diagnose ongoing latency issues and option c cloudwatch logs for dms endpoint while error messages in the logs can provide clues they might not be specific enough to identify the source database as the root cause so we are almost thinking of leaving our detect detective job but then we happen to look at option d and we are like oh yeah you know this proves it so whatever this guy is saying is might be true so here you are seeing cdc latency source similar to incoming changes you have this metric obviously the name itself is a big giveaway it's like you are detective and the um, what do you call the uh, culprit he ha he he put a paper on his face saying i did it so it's that easy <laughs> this metric measures the latency between the time a change is committed in the source database and when aws dms captures it a high value for this metric indicates that the source database is taking longer to make changes available to for replication thus contributing to the overall latency by focusing on cdc latency source metric and investigating the postgresql database you can effectively pinpoint the cause of latency and take appropriate steps to resolve it a lab uses iot sensors to monitor humidity temperature pressure and the sensors send 100 kb of data every 10 seconds a downstream process will read the data from s3 bucket every 30 seconds so which solution will deliver the data to s3 bucket with least latency let's look at the options first of all you might be thinking oh okay it's um we need to stream and then write to s3 so you would be thinking of using data firehose because this is the service that actually writes to s3 so both options d and a are using firehose but i would eliminate them immediately why you would be like firehose is a service that writes to s3 why are you eliminating it well if you look at this here they are saying use default buffer interval here they are saying use 5 second buffer interval but if you know firehose you would know default buffer interface for firehose is 60 seconds okay clearly it won't work for us because you know you can see why it won't work whereas option d is talking about use 5 second well the default is 60 seconds and it is also the minimum so the buffer periods you can give for firehose range from 60 seconds to 900 seconds which clearly eliminates both option a and d so if it is not firehose then what is it option b and c both are mentioning data streams but we already know data streams cannot directly deliver data to s3 so by that you can eliminate this option which will be right because 
this one because you need a consumer to read the data from the stream and deliver it to s3 here it is not happening but here they are using kinesis client library which is the uh, consumer that delivers the data to s3 so it's as simple as that it's just knowing the defaults helps you answer these questions all right another drama question where a company wants to use ml to perform analytics on data that is in s3 data lake now they want they has two data transformation requirements that will give consumers within the company the ability to create reports the company must perform daily transformations on 300 gb of data in variety of format that must arrive in s3 at a scheduled time and they want to for perform one time transformations of terabytes of archive data in s3 data lake and they you are using mwaa apache airflow the managed workflows to orchestrate the processing now which combination of tasks should the company schedule in uh, apache airflow to meet these requirements most cost effectively and we already discussed the better best way to create tables on top of files s3 files is using glue crawler we already established that didn't we so if you look at that this athena scanning the data identifying the schema it cannot do that athena don't have it athena is just what sql querying on top of s3 it cannot identify the schema and option d yeah well cd we will talk about them but for identifying the schema between a and b a is the answer you will use glue crawlers which are cost effective way to automatically discover and catalog schemas for data stored in s3 they are designed for this purpose and they can handle a variety of data formats making them ideal for the daily incoming data in this scenario and coming to the transformations which one would you use option e is using SageMaker. SageMaker is primarily focused on machine learning, develop <clears throat> model development, and deployment, not about data transformation. While it can be used for data preparation, it might not be the most cost-effective option for this scenario. So between Redshift and EMR, I will eliminate Redshift as well because this is a powerful data warehouse, but it can be expensive for data transformation tasks, especially for one-time transformations of large archive data set. You wouldn't go and deploy a redshift cluster for one-time transformation would you of course we wouldn't at least if they mentioned maybe redshift serverless maybe we can think about it because you don't have to provision a server for one time instead you would use serverless for it but at least based on these options i would pick d because emr is a powerful and scalable platform for big data processing making it well suited for both daily and archive data transformations it supports a wide range of processing frameworks like spark which can handle large scale data processing efficiently additionally emr can be configured to run on a schedule ensuring that the daily transformations are performed consistently a company uses glue etl uh, operations on a data set that contains information about customer orders now they want to implement specific validation rules to ensure data accuracy and consistency and how do you do this if you look at option a is they are talking about using job bookmarks we already you know discussed about bookmarks these are primarily used for tracking progress in etl jobs and resuming from failures they are not used for data validation and then we have option c which is using glue data quality transforms while glue provides some built-in data quality transforms they might not cover all your specific validation requirements because they might be uh, you know company specific so for that reason you won't use those whatever the built-in ones that are there at least and then option d is talking about aws glue data catalog data catalog is what it is a metadata repository that helps you organize and manage your data assets it's essential for data governance, but doesn't directly address data validation. So what are those? Yes, glue data quality, but not built-in transforms, but custom ones because validation rules sometimes will be specific to the company's business. So the glue data catalog, sorry, do glue data quality rule sets allows you to define specific data quality rules tailored 
to your business requirements you can create rules to check for data completeness accuracy validity and consistency based on your specific criteria you can customize rule sets for different data sets or tables ensuring that each data source is validated according to its unique characteristics and requirements rule sets can be easily integrated into your existing loop etl jobs allowing you to perform data quality checks as part of your standard data processing workflows you can combine multiple rules within a rule set to perform comprehensive data validation ensuring that your data meets all your quality standards before it's used for analysis or reporting and i have noticed that 70 percent of the viewers on our channel are not subscribed so if you are one of those not subscribed people let me know in the comments what content i should add to this channel to get your subscription because i don't want you to subscribe because i am asking i only want you guys to subscribe to this channel if you find there is useful information on the in channel for you so if you are one of these then let me know what content i should add to this channel so that i can get your subscription and for those 30 people awesome people thank you very much for subscribing but i would also make a request for you to like and comment the video so that youtube recommends this video for everyone who searches for these questions so it's in your hands if you don't like and comment then youtube won't push our video to many people our goal is what take this video to as many people as we can so that everybody can pass the exam right so let's do that go ahead and like and comment on this video and thank you very much for subscribing this to this channel an insurance company stores transactional data that the company compressed with zzip company needs to query the transactional data for occasional audits which solution will meet this requirement in most cost effective way okay first of all compressed with zzip this doesn't mean that they have the entire transactional data in a single zip file that you need to be uh, clarified off okay because that makes a difference in the options that we pick when they say the transactional data is compressed which means for example transactional data is something that you get every day or sometimes every hour if, and if it is real time you know as you get the data you will get it in your uh, wherever whichever place it is i'm assuming this is s3 so today's data you get it then you zzip so you will have let's say part one and uh, tomorrow again part two this is zzip and this is zzipped etc okay so these are multiple files or multiple objects in s3 and using s3 select which is what mentioned in option a and option b what you can do is you can only query on a particular file or on a particular object okay if you want to do s3 select on all the objects let's say these are in a folder called uh, stores right let's say you have a stores folder and in the folder you have using s3 select you cannot query on the complete folder it's not possible so for that reason we will eliminate a and b okay that need that's why i said this should, you should be very clear about this next it comes you are using athena sure you can query athena on the folder and it will query all the objects under it both are using Athena, but difference is here you are storing in S3 standard, here in Glacier Instant Retrieval. Since it said most cost effective, you might immediately go to Glacier instance. But the problem here is this is transactional data, but they are using it for occasional audits. It is very important to know how often they will query this data. Since they said occasional, um, I would not go with once an year or twice an year even if that's the case there is difference like s3 standard and then you have glacier okay instant retrieval yeah may even this one you will get it in milliseconds even that but the cost varies so under standard and under glacier you will have storage costs then retrieval cost okay for standard storage cost is around 0.023 per gb i am talking about this is i think us east based on the region the cost varies and then glacier if you go both storage and retrieval 
storage it's very less 0 0.004 and retrieval is something that is i am concerned about which is 0 0.03 per gb and retrieval for standard is zero so when you go here it is 0 0.02 for GB for both storage and retrieval and this one comes around per GB combined both storage and retrieval so which one is highest the glacier is highest but when will this be highest when you query it if you don't query and if you just store the data which is much much cheaper than this one but if you look at the storage cost is this much and the retrieval is this much based on you know since this is transactional data and they said occasional edits i would go with a combination of both and for me standard looks cheaper than glacier because of the retrieval if they only talk about just storing or archiving data then blindly you can go with glacier because it is much much less but here we are talking about retrieving it as well so i would go with option c again i would say the question is not complete here they didn't they said occasional occasional is how long how much is it monthly once or yearly once yearly twice so i would go with this but i explained you based on that if you want to pick d it's up to you but i would pick option c a data engineer finished testing and uh, redshift stored procedure that processes and inserts data into a table that is not mission critical not mission critical engineer wants to automatically run the stored procedures on a daily basis how do you do it with most cost effective way okay most cost effective way which means less number of services that should be involved and if you look at option a you are using lambda function to schedule a cron job do you think that's an uh, cost effective will come to that but there are so many things on aws that you can use for scheduling do you want to have a lambda function to do that this will work don't take me wrong but it involves setting up and managing a lambda function which incurs costs based on execution time and memory usage additionally you will need to handle any potential failures or retries within the lambda function so i won't pick this one and option b is talking about using an ec2 instance even though it is part instance doesn't matter and managing the data api calls spot instances can be cost effective but there's still the cost of instance and the potential for interruptions even though they said it's not mission critical you still have to provision that and then we have option d where we are using glue which is a powerful etl service but it might be overkill for simply scheduling a stored procedure it would likely be more expensive than using the built-in redshift scheduler yes you heard me redshift itself has a built-in scheduler okay so it has something called query editor v2 means just version 2 with it has a where you can run the queries and one good thing is it has a built-in scheduler that allows you to schedule sql queries and stored procedures directly within the redshift console this eliminates the need for external services like lambda or ec2 instances since the scheduler is part of redshift service there are no additional costs associated with using it the scheduling interface in query editor v2 is user friendly and straightforward to set up so everything works out for us the marketing company collects clickstream data clickstream data is nothing but whenever you browse some website each click is being stored behind the scenes that's what clickstream data basically is the company sends the clickstream data to kinesis data firehouse and stores the clickstream data in s3 now they want to build a series of dashboards that hundreds of users from multiple departments will use they are using quicksight to develop the dashboards now they want a solution that can scale and provide daily updates about clickstream activity and they would want to do it with most cost effectively now we need to pick what are the options to do and if you analyze this these three and these two are categorized into one so when you pick one the others will be obviously wrong now they are talking about using redshift to store and query the clickstream data i wouldn't do that because this data is stored in s3 and just to it's just so quick uh, quick site can um, read the data it's i don't think it's optimal for us to store it 
in redshift because redshift is a powerful data warehouse and it can be expensive to maintain especially for the data that is primarily used for analysis and reporting in quick sight so you can eliminate this one and s3 analytics if you know what that is you would immediately eliminate it because S3 Analytics is not designed for interactive querying and dashboarding. It's more suited for generating storage metrics and reports. Whatever the objects that you stored in S3, it gives analytics on those, not the analytics, uh, whatever analytics we are talking about. So that will make this the correct option. Yes, Athena is serverless query service. Directly query data in S3 without the need for complex infrastructure. It's a cost-effective solution for analyzing clickstream data, especially for ad hoc queries and analysis. Now comes the quick side part. So you have the data, but you access the data through what? Quick side direct SQL query or quick side spice? I would go with this one. Quick side spice, uh, spice, not quick side direct SQL query because direct SQL queries can be slower and less efficient than using spice, especially for large data set for complex calculation. But what is spice? Well, spice is quick sites in memory engine that optimizes data for fast and interactive dashboards. By configuring a daily refresh, you ensure that your dashboards always reflect the latest click stream activity meeting the requirement for daily updates if you don't know what this is we have done it i think three to four projects in our projects playlist that i mentioned before so go check it out uh, yes we used quick site spice and yes we used athena stable so how it works you have s3 files in s3 then you have glue crawler right which crawls these s3 files and creates tables in data catalog or glue data catalog whatever you want to call it then athena queries or runs queries on these tables that will uh, bring the data from s3 and here's where quick site comes into picture so quick site uses athena tables athena tables uses glue data catalog tables that are created metadata and these tables actually query the data from s3 so this is how we did multiple projects. Go check those playlists. It's really awesome. This is an easy one because they kind of gave away the answer. So basically, they want to use an orchestrator workflow. And as soon as you see the, okay, what is happening? Okay, okay. As soon as you see the orchestration workflow, you would think of uh, glue workflow. They said glue, so you can eliminate this because glue is different than glue workflows. And then you will think of uh, step functions for orchestration and then MWAA because this is what is, I think, asked in a, at least four to five questions in this video. But when I say give, the giveaway, because this hybrid model in, should include on-premises resources as well as in the cloud. And they want to prioritize portable and open source resources. So step functions is not open source. Glue is not open source. What is open source? Apache Airflow is open source. Oh. Apache Airflow is open source. So that's why I said it is a free giveaway. And data exchange, come on. This is primarily for finding, subscribing to, and using third party data in the cloud. It doesn't address data orchestration. And simple workflow service. This is a fully managed state tracker and task coordinator. While it can be used for workflow orchestration, it's not open source and might not be as portable as Airflow. Anything that's Amazon is not open source okay these are managed service for apache whenever you see apache that is open source okay so basically you can immediately eliminate abd because they are not open source even if you don't know what they do but the answer is mwa managed workflow for uh, apache airflow which is a widely used open source workflow management platform uh, this means it can be deployed and run in various environments, including on-premises and in the cloud. Since Airflow is open source, you can easily move your workflows between environments with minimal modifications. A gaming company uses a NoSQL database to store customer information. And the company is planning to migrate to AWS. And they want a fully managed solution that will handle high online transaction processing workload and provide single digit millisecond performance and provide high availability around the world and they want to do it with least operational overhead so whenever you see no sql database with a combination of single mil digit millisecond that will only give you dynamo db
okay only dynamo db can have single digit millisecond which is this one and you can eliminate time stream time stream is just a time series database which is not suitable for general purpose no sql workloads and dynamo db is optimized for document based workloads and might not be best fit in our case and key spaces are managed cassandra service it's how would i put it it might require more expertise in cassandra data modeling and administration compared to dynamodb and obviously we won't pick any third party tool or managed service or anything such when we have dynamodb that can handle this one so our answer is c and the final question for the day and it's about access denied so basically there is a lambda function that event bridge event will invoke and when the data engineer tried to invoke the lambda function by using event bridge they got access denied exception how should the data engineer resolve the exception let's look at the options option a trust policy of lambda function or lambda execution role while the trust policy is important it's not directly related to event bridges ability to invoke the function the trust policy defines who can assume the role not who can invoke the lambda function and option c private subnet the subnet configuration doesn't affect event bridge ability to invoke a lambda function and option d event bridge schemas and event mapping these are used for event filtering and data transformation they don't control the permissions required for invocations so what is causing this issue option b iam role for event bridge needs permissions to invoke the lambda function this is typically granted by attaching a iam policy to the role that event bridge assumes the policy should include the lambda invoke function action on the specific lambda function ar right in addition to the event bridge role the lambda function when you go to lambda function in the brief source based policy you need to explicitly allow the event bridge service to invoke it two places event bridge to able to trigger the lambda lambda able to act let the event bridge trigger it so you need to go in two places you need to do it this policy should specify the event bridge service principle as the source and allow the invoke function action which is done here so that's the answer so that concludes this video i hope you enjoyed these new questions and the analysis if you do then you know go subscribe comment like and all that awesome stuff and thank you for spending your time here so far whoever watched our previous 80 questions they passed with flying colors 100 percent um, with 100 percent marks and i wish you the same let me know in the comments and thank you very much for you spending your time here all the best for your exams have a great day see you in the next video peace out